Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today to, uh, to talk through bioremediation, uh, restoring contaminated ecosystems, and doing that in a natural way. First of all, global contamination. Unfortunately, it's everywhere. There are over 3 million sites contaminated around the world, and they're only the ones we know of. It's likely to be three times that number. These contaminated sites are mainly in urban areas, so associated with anthropogenic and human activity. It's a serious environmental and a health issue. Where there's a lot of urban environments, then, then you tend to get an accumulation of uh, contaminants. And where there's dense housing, you know, you, you would start to see much larger concentrations where it's, uh, you know, treatment systems are not appropriate or have been outdated and just can't deal with the numbers. But unfortunately, once, once those compounds are in the environment, they can be transported vast distances. So truly is a global issue. There are many ways of dealing with these contaminants. In the environment, we can incinerate them, especially if they're uh, oil-based products. But there are potential contaminants coming out of those chimney stacks, dioxins. But in Australia, very few incinerators are being operated. In the US, there's many more. Here, we take on the idea of using landfills. It's a cheap way of, of dealing with an issue, but it doesn't solve the problem. Solidification is actually using some sort of binding matrix like cement. So you take contaminated soil, you bind it with cement so it becomes a solid, so it doesn't leach, and you either bury it in a landfill or you place it under a bridge in the cement. Again, you're not having any cleaning up of those contaminants. Thermal desorption, heating the soil at very high temperatures to volatilize the contaminants. Very effective technology, very expensive, but it does remove the contaminants and they can be used as an energy source if it's an oil-based product. Problem is that soil is dead. Bioremediation, this is the subject of today, is using naturally occurring organisms present in the environment, present in the soil, present in the water, to effectively treat, the, attenuate the contaminants. Once and for all, destroying the contaminants, so producing carbon dioxide and water. So we solve the problem now. So what is bioremediation? This is using biological systems, especially bacteria, although plants have been used, or fungi, to remove those harmful contaminants, oil, pesticides, all sorts of compounds from the environment. How do these organisms so small potentially have such a profound effect and sustain our environment? It's all to do with the number. The number is estimated to be 5 million trillion trillion bacteria. There are 300 to 500,000 million tons of biomass. They're by far the biggest biomass on the planet. And that reason makes them very, very important to all living organisms on the planet. So they're the fundamentals. What can they do? Well, if we look back of the history of bioremediation, a third of all bioremediation activities at a commercial scale have been through petroleum-based products. And microbes have lived side by side with, with crude oil for billions of years. They are very effective organisms at breaking down oil and using the carbon as a, as a means of growth. Then there's the historical. Things like creosote, a derivative of oil, is very carcinogenic, very toxic. Solvent industries, pesticides, anywhere where industry has been around for some time will create contamination because perhaps 50 or 100 years ago, the idea was that the environment was a good receptacle for all waste. Why bioremediation compared to all of those other technologies? Well, low cost. Microbes work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. And all you need to do is to look after them. Make sure they've got what they need to grow. And it's not just one technology. And in fact, no site is ever the same. Every site starts with the site investigation, sampling, looking at the topography, the groundwater, and starting to develop a remediation action plan based around the site. I think uh, generally that uh, when, when oils are in uh, soils, they don't transport readily because they tend to bind to organic materials. So if it's uh, you know, a clay material, uh, if it's got a lot of organic matter, then those bitumens, those oils will be tightly bound to, to the soil matrix. And uh, you may get wash out of some products, of breakdown products or some other 
parts of the oil, but generally not, not those road, that very heavy molecular weight compounds. Um, but nevertheless, once they're in the soil, they're very hard to break down. What about more difficult, more complex compounds that don't exist naturally, like chlorinated compounds? Perchloroethene, trichloroethene, which were used for a long, long time in dry cleaning, used as degreasing agents for almost 70 or 80 years. They exist in our groundwater now. They're very difficult to treat, even at low concentrations. They're regarded as highly hazardous. So you can fracture to recover the groundwater, so somehow destroy the flow path of the groundwater and pump it out. But then you have to replace that water with something. Otherwise, a hole in the ground will fall. You can try using something called permeable reactive barriers, which is something you, uh, you place in the stream flow of the contaminated groundwater, and the contaminant will bind preferentially to those reactive barriers. Or you can use bioremediation, and it's something uh, that has been very, very effective. So these are chlorinated hydrocarbons. So ethene has been, the hydrogen has been replaced by chlorine, which is not a naturally occurring compound or very rarely. About 10 years ago, researchers identified this tiny organism, Dehalococoides. It's only one micron in length and 0.1 micron in width. And it has this kind of a stalk. It's only found in groundwater, but remarkably, it was able to break down very effectively these chlorine groups by sequentially taking off a chlorine group. So you have four chlorine groups, you have three, two, one. This is vinyl chloride. And then finally, you produce ethene. So it's a reductive dechlorination. You're reducing the compound. And ethene can be assimilated, and you can remove this compound from the environment once and for all. Tremendous technology, tremendous organism, and is the basis of an amazing technology. In fact, you can buy these strains now. They're commercially available for you to buy off the shelf and tip into groundwater. Now, we, we're not advocates of that because they are, they may not be indigenous to Australia, to our groundwaters. We want to use naturally occurring organisms. So we shied away from using commercially available to deal with our issues. What is the future challenge? We are heading towards a future that doesn't have oil, that doesn't use some of these pollutants. Is bioremediation going to fall by the wayside as a technology only for legacy products? I believe the answer is no, because unfortunately we are still polluting our environment day in, day out, with a whole range of new products. And here's where we're going to have to move back into the world of DNA and understanding communities and what they do and start using synthetic biology creating new biological parts, new devices, new systems. So that's the future. But we've learned so much from bioremediation in the past 20 or 30 years that I feel confident that we can tackle these new emerging pollutants effectively using bioremediation. Everything we use and we throw away or we flush away, we have to start thinking, well, what happens to that? It goes somewhere. It goes for treatment. It's a really important process. But at the moment, there's a lot of those products which will go through the treatment unaffected and will end up in the environment, end up in, in the biota, end up in some of the things that we're going to then use and consume, plants, animals. We have to take responsibility. I think Every individual needs to look and try to minimize the footprint in terms of what they're producing, make things sustainable, make things, use things that are degradable. I think, you know, pass that message on. If, if there's enough people saying that message, then industry will start to look at, invest more in new technologies, less, uh, less uh, invasive technologies, perhaps, le less of a threat to the environment. Legislation will be able to be tightened. And that will be an important step in our sustainability of these unique Australia flora and fauna. Finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the funding bodies that made a lot of this uh, work and research possible. Those 80 plus students who've worked with me for their PhDs, 30 or so postdocs who've been with me, all those collaborators from around the world have been uh, important. So thank you very much.